Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timperley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Today's special guest presenter is our good friend Tony Connor. Hello, Tony. Tony, how are you doing? Hi, Simon. Hi, everybody. I'm fine, thank you. Good, good. And what are we talking about today, Tony? Uh, we're going to do implementing an SQF Code Edition 9 food safety management system. Very good. And you, so you've poured over that standard and pulled out all of the the gaps from eight to nine for us today. That's nice. Um, right. OK. Type in the sidebar. Tell us where you're joining us from today, as you usually do. Um, it's lovely to see you all every week and to see where you're joining us from. You know, Egypt, California, Rhonda, uh, Manila in the Philippines. USA, Mexico, England. I saw Lancashire before, and I'm Lancashire. Ramsbottom is where I'm from. Anyway, on that note, I'm going to play the uh, sponsor ads, and we'll be back in a couple of minutes for the presentation. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. slides on and uh, I'll be back for the Q&A later and for now I'll hand you over to Tony. Okay thank you Simon. So we'll go through the presentation and answer questions at the end. Okay so the SQF code is a GFSI benchmark standard. In order to be recognized by GFSI certification program own owners such as the SQFI must meet benchmarking requirements. There are GFSI benchmarking requirements for a right, wide range of industry scopes. 
changes in part three of the GFSI benchmarking requirements in 2020 include the requirement for food safety culture, facility inspections, verification of cleaning, and control of cross-contamination. Part three of the GFSI benchmarking requirements defines key elements required in a certification program in relation to hazard and risk management systems, food safety management systems, and good industry practices. Most of these certification program owners have submitted certification programs to GFSI and are undergoing GFSI benchmarking requirements process for version 2020 of the benchmarking requirements. So SQFI provides one of the most globally recognized food safety and quality certification programs. SQF Vision is to be the single most trusted source for global food safety and quality certification. The SQF program has been owned and managed by the Food Marketing Institute since 2003 and was first recognized in 2004 by the GFSI. The Safe Quality Food Institute publishes a suit of globally recognized food safety and quality codes. The latest edition is edition nine for audits beginning in May 2021. Steps to certification include documenting and implementing your food safety management system an SQF license accredited certification body must conduct the certification audit in order for you to gain SQF certification. So we're going to concentrate on the SQF food safety code for manufacturing, which has two element, two modules that are relevant system elements. And good manufacturing practices for processing of food products. So for system elements, the first section is management commitment. Management should demonstrate commitment as, to, as per 2.1.1 management responsibility and prepare and implement a food safety policy statement that includes a commitment to comply with customer and regulatory requirements, establish a food safety culture and continually improve. There should be a commitment of all site management to, to supply safe food and also establish and continually improve the site's food safety management system. Site management should ensure departments and operations are appropriately staffed and organized, organizationally aligned to meet food safety objectives. The policy statement should be signed by the site senior manager manager and displayed in prominent positions. It should be effectively communicated to all site personnel in languages understood by all personnel. So talking about management commitment, I'd just like to point out this from FSMA final rule. The owner, operator or agent in charge of the facility must sign and date the food safety plan. A fundamental factor in the management of product safety is food safety culture. The SQF codes require site management to lead and support a food safety culture. For this culture to flourish and the importance of product safety to be understood by all members, members of staff, it needs to be led from the top of the organization and to ensure that the necessary commitment, support and resources are available. The establishment, documentation and communication of all relevant, to all relevant staff of food safety objectives and performance measures. Food safety practices and all applicable requirements of the SQF system should be adopted and maintained. 
employees should be import informed and held accountable for their food safety and regulatory responsibilities. Employees should be empowered to act to resolve food safety issues. You may, re you may remember this incident. This guy was jailed for 28 years in the US for his role in a national, national salmonella outbreak linked to nine deaths. The ex-owner of Peanut Corporation of America was convicted of knowingly shipping tainted products. So, senior management should be delivering a this is how we do things here. By demonstrating leadership, demonstrating visible commitment, effective communication, ensuring there is accountability, developing employee confidence and mut mutual trust, developing reward schemes, developing an action plan for the development and continuing improvement of the food safety culture. On to management responsibility. Senior management must define the organizational reporting structure and responsibility for food safety shall be identified and communicated within the site. Senior management should ensure adequate resources are available to support the SQF system. Senior management must designate an SQF practitioner and substitute practitioner for each site. All staff should be informed of their responsibility to report food safety problems. Job descriptions for those responsible for food safety must be documented. Senior site management shall ensure the training needs of the site are resourced, implemented, and meet the requirements outlined in System Elements 2.9 training, and also ensure that site personnel meet the required competencies to carry out those functions affecting the legality and safety of food products. In order to have an effective site, there needs to be effective communication and contribution from all departments. On to management review. Management review should include changes to the food safety management system documentation, including policies, procedures, specification, and food safety plans. Review should include food safety culture performance, food safety objectives, and performance measures. Review should include corrective and preventive actions and trends in findings from internal and external audits, customer complaints, and verification and validation activities, the hazard and risk management system, and any follow-up actions from previous reviews. On to complaint management. There should be a documented procedure for handling customer complaints which includes details of who is responsible for investigating the cause and resolution of customer complaints. Complaint management is important. To get this valuable feedback, complaint reporting must generate information swiftly and systematically to the appropriate managers or departments. Initial screening should trigger immediate action when necessary. So I'd like to mention this. This is from previous guidance, but I think it's worth uh, referring back to these because there's useful guidance in them. Customer complaints may be the first record that an auditor asks to review when beginning the site audit. Customer complaints provide an important measure of how well the SQF system is performing. By accurately recording customer complaint types, a supplier can objectively measure changes in their management system and show improvements in a process. Customer complaints may also show trends that have not been identified during process and normal process control checks. Customer complaint records with details of investigations should be maintained. Root cause analysis conducting, 
conducted using the five whys technique, for example. Corrective action should be implemented commensurate with the seriousness of the incident. Adverse trends of customer complaint data should be in investigated and analyzed and the root cause established. I use an annual complaints analyzer to do this. Complaints are analyzed monthly and yearly. Here you can see a year-on-year -year complaint level comparison. There is a general improvement year-on-year. -year. You can also see summer peaks which are less pronounced as the performance improved. Communication is, impo is important in improving your complaint performance. Here are weekly summaries broken down into production lines for the benefit of communicating performance to staff. A memo or notification of serious complaints should be displayed to make staff aware of the complaint or for use in team briefs. So on to section 2.2, document control and records. And 2.2.1, food safety management system. A food safety management system must be documented and implemented including a summary of the food safety policies and methods, the food safety policy statement and organizational chart, processes and products included in the scope of certification, food safety regulations that apply, specifications, food safety procedures, prerequisite programs, food safety plans, process controls that impact on product safety, and other documentation necessary to support the development, implementation, maintain, maintenance and control of the SQF system. Document control. There should be a document control procedure for document control, including responsibilities for ensuring personnel have access to current documents and maintaining document control. A register of current food safety management system documents and amendments to documents should be maintained. Records. A system needs to be in place to verify, maintain and retain records. Records must be securely stored. Legible records demonstrating compliance should be maintained. All records should be retained in accordance with company, customer, and legislative requirements. On to 2.3, specifications, formalizations, realization, and supplier approval. This section includes requirements for product development and realization. It requires that the methods and responsibility for designing, developing, and converting product concepts to commercial realization to be documented. Product formulation should be developed by authorized persons. There should be trials to validate and verify products as necessary. On to specifications. There are requirements to develop, manage, and approve raw material, finished product, and packaging specifications. Raw materials, packaging, and ingredients need to be validated. There needs to be descriptions of services for contract service provide providers. Specifications should be approved. There needs to be verification of packaging. Finished product labels must be accurate, comply with legislation, and be approved. Products should bear appropriate information to ensure that adequate information is available to the next person in the food chain to enable them to handle products safely. 
Insufficient information can lead to products being mishandled at later stages in the food chain. Contract manufacturers. The methods and responsibility for ensuring all agreements related to customer product requirements must be documented and implemented. On to the approved supplier program. The responsibility and procedure for selecting, evaluating, approving and monitoring an approved supplier must be documented and implemented. Raw materials, ingredients, package materials and services that impact on finished product safety must meet agreed specifications and be supplied by an approved supplier. Supplier approval needs to be based on risk. This is an example of a supplier assessment template. Supplier approval can be assisted by certificate and scope validation directories. You need to make sure the scope is correct for the material or service that you are purchasing. You also need to document methods and frequency of reviewing approved supplier performance and status. Product label and labeling control good practices include that any changes to labels are approved and communicated to goods receipt personnel, and an assigned approved standard should be provided to staff carrying out checks. On to section 2.4 food safety system and 2.41 legislation. Product delivered to customer must comply with food safety legislation in, in, applicable in the country of manufacture and sale. 2.42 Good manufacturing practices described in the food safety code must be applied or exempted based on risk analysis. On to 2.43 The food safety plan. A food safety plan shall be prepared in accordance with the 12 steps identified in the Codex Alimentarius Commission HACCP guidelines. That's from Food, safety, food Manufacturing Code. For storage, it says, the system shall be based on risk, systematic and comprehensive, and based on HACCP or preventive controls. The food safety plans or plan should be developed and maintained by a multidisciplinary team which includes the SQF practitioner and personnel from technical production and engineering. The requirements for defining the scope, product descriptions, intended use, having a flow diagram, you need to identify and document all food safety hazards that can be reasonably expected to occur. You need to conduct a hazard analysis for every identified hazard to determine which hazards are significant. You need to determine and document the control measures that must be applied to the significant hazards. And then or identify any critical control points. HACCP plans should include process step, hazard, control measure for each identified critical control point the food safety team need to identify and document the critical limits. Critical limits should be validated. You need to develop and document procedures to monitor CCPs, develop and document deviation, corrective actions and corrections, that the, and identify the disposition of an affected product when monitoring indicates a loss of control at the CCP. There needs to be relevant record, reference to relevant records. The documented and approved food safety plans should be implemented in full. The implementation should be monitored by the food safety team. 
Control point monitoring, corrective action, and verification records need to be maintained. Documented procedures and all work instructions can ensure that production of a consistently safe and legal product in compliance with the food safety plan. A, re a review of the documented and implemented plans can be, needs to be conducted at least annually or when there are changes to process equipment inputs or other changings affecting product safety. Changes affecting product safety need to be approved by authorised personnel. On to product sampling, inspection and analysis. On-site laboratories conducting chemical and microbiological analyses need to be located and controlled to prevent a risk to product safety. Sampling and testing methods shall be in accordance with the applicable requirements of ISO 17025, including annual proficiency testing for staff conducting analyses. The methods, responsibility and criteria for sampling, inspecting and or analysing raw materials, working products and finished products needs to be documented and implemented. The significance of laboratory results should be understood and acted upon. On to non-conforming materials and products. Document procedures should describe how non-conforming material and products are controlled. All relevant staff should understand quarantine and release procedures. Records of non-conforming product and its alternative use or disposal should be maintained. Product week recall, sorry, product rework. Rework procedures should describe responsibilities and ensure traceability is maintained. Rework is inspected or analysed as required before release. Rework operations are carried out by trained personnel and supervised as per the food safety plan. Rework is identified. All rework should be recorded. Product release. A procedure to ensure that FedEx product is only released when legislative and other established food safety controls have been met should be in place. Product should only be released by authorised personnel and include a label check. Product release should be recorded. On to 2.48, environmental monitoring. An environmental monitoring program must be in place for all manufacturing processes. The environmental monitoring program should be risk-based. An environmental sampling and testing schedule must be prepared. It should detail the applicable pathogens or indicator organisms. On to 2.5 SQF system verification and 2.5.1 validation and effectiveness. You need to ensure that good manufacturing practices are confirmed to ensure they achieve the required result. Critical food safety limits are reviewed annually and revalidated as necessary or justified when changes occur. Changes to the processes or procedures need to be assessed to ensure controls are still effective. Verification activities. A verification schedule must be prepared and implemented. The methods, responsibility and criteria for verifying monitoring of good manufacturing practices 
critical control points and other food safety controls and the legality of products must be documented and implemented. On to corrective and preventative action. Documented procedures should describe how corrections and corrective actions are investigated, resolved, managed and controlled. Records of investigations, identification of the root cause and resolution of corrections and corrective action, including non-compliances with critical food safety lim limits should be maintained. On to internal audits and inspections. A documented internal audit pre procedure with responsibility for scheduling and conducting audits should be in place. Internal audits should be scheduled and conducted to verify the effectiveness of the food safety management system. Internal audits should be conducted in full and at least annually. Internal audits can be managed using checklists. All requirements of the SQF Food Safety Code should be audited as per the SQF audit checklist or similar tool. Staff conducting internal audits should be trained and competent in internal audit procedures. Where practical, staff conducting internal audits shall be independent of the function being audited. Objective evidence should be recorded to verify compliance and or non-compliance. Corrective and preventive action of deficiencies identified during the audit internal audits are undertaken and audit results are communicated to relevant management personnel and staff responsible for implementing and verifying corrective and preventive actions. Corrective and preventive actions of deficiencies identified during the internal audits are undertaken and the effectiveness verified. Regular inspections of the site and equipment must be carried out to verify good manufacturing practices and facility stroke equipment maintenance. Records of internal audits and inspections and any corrective and preventive action taken should be recorded. Onto product traceability and crisis management. Product identification. The system must ensure raw materials, ingredients, packaging materials, work in progress, process inputs and finished products are clearly identified during all stages of receipt, production, storage and dispatch. Finished products should be labeled to customer specification and or regulatory requirements. Finished product must be traceable to the customer. The effectiveness of the system should be tested. The traceability system must cover all through the process to the manufacturing supplier and date of receipt of raw materials, food contacting packaging and other materials. Lot identification is essential in product recall and also helps effective stock rotation. Product withdraw and recall. The responsibility and methods used to withdraw or recall products shall be documented and implemented, including identifying those responsible for initiating, managing, and investigating a product withdrawal or recall. Management procedures to be implemented, including sources of advice and essential traceability information. There should be a communication plan to inform customers, consumers, authorities and other essential bodies in a timely manner. An investigation must be undertaken to determine the root cause of a withdrawal, mock recall or recall. The product withdrawal and recall system must be re reviewed, tested and verified as effectively at least annually. On to crisis management planning. There should be a crisis management procedure, including a business continuity plan based on known dangers to product safety, such as flood, draft, fire, tsunami, or other severe weather offense, civil unrest, warfare, computer outage, pandemic, loss of electricity or refrigeration, ammonia leak, or labor strike. 
food defence and food fraud. Food defence plan. A food defence threat assessment needs to be conducted to identify potential threats that can be caused by a deliberate act of sabotage or terrorist-like incident. Based on the assessment, a food defence plan must be documented, implemented and communicated, providing details of the responsibilities, controls, methods and measures taken. Food fraud. The methods, responsibility and criteria for identifying the site's vulnerability to food fraud must be documented, implemented and maintained. A food fraud mitigation plan must be written, providing details of the responsibility, control, methods and measures taken. On to allergen management. The responsibility and methods used to control allergens and to prevent contamination from sources of allergens must be documented and implemented. The allergen management program shall include a risk analysis of those raw materials, ingredients and processing aids, including lubricants that contain food allergens. A list of allergens that is applicable in the country of manufacture and countries of destination when known should be accessible to all relevant staff. An assessment of workplace related food allergens that may originate from locker rooms, vending machines, lunch rooms and visitors. The controls associated with hazards associated with allergens and should be incorporated into the food safety plan. There may need to be consideration for scheduling, changeover procedures, control of week rework, and methods to control the accuracy of product labels. There may also be a need for verification and validation of cleaning, and limits of acceptable and acceptable cleaning performance should be defined for food contact services and process equipment. Training. There are requirements for a training requirements and training program. Training should be provided for all personnel carrying out functions essential to the food safety management systems and tasks to relate, related to food safety and legality. There are quite a number of specific requirements, so I'd refer to 2.92 on that. So on to good industry practices and the SQF code module 11 so good manufacturing practices for the processing of food products section 1.1 is site location and premises and includes premises location and approval local activities and the site environment must need to be assessed to identify risks that may impact on product safety and implement measures to control the risks the location of premises, building, operations and the land use must not affect hygiene and food safety. The premises and operations on site should be approved by the local relevant authority. Establishments should be located away from environmentally polluted areas and industrial activities which pose a threat of contaminating food, coming out, contaminating food areas subject to flooding, areas prone to pest infestments, infestations, areas where waste cannot be removed effectively. The construction layer of the site, buildings and facilities should be applicable to the operation. On to building materials. There are standards prescribed for windows, stairs, catwalks, platforms, doors, ducting, conduit, pipes, hatches, floors, drains, walls, partitions, ceilings, light and light fittings. In certain areas, particularly where product is exposed, light fixtures need to be shatterproof, manufactured with a shatterproof covering or fitted with protective covers. Lighting needs to be of an appropriate intensity to enable staff to carry out their tasks. 
Inspection area. A suitable area close to the processing line needs to be provided for inspection of product when online inspection is required. External per personal access doors, external doors, including overhead dock doors, external windows, ventilation openings, doors and other openings must be effectively sealed when closed and proofed against dust, vermin and other pests. Adequate ventilation should be provided in enclosed processing and food handling areas. Where appropriate, positive air pressure systems shall be installed. Extractor fans and canopies shall be provided in areas where open cooking operations are carried out or where large amount of steam is generated. Equipment and utensils. There are requirements for specifications and procedures for purchasing. Equipment and utensils need to be regulatory requirements and not pose a risk of contamination. There are requirements for equipment storage rooms, product contact surfaces, benches, tables, conveyor, and mechanical processing equipment. Equipment surfaces, product containers, tubs and bins, bins used for inedible material, Equipment and utensils should be cleaned after use. And the requirements for vehicles used in food rooms. And also non-conforming equipment shall be identified, tagged and or segregated. Records of the non-conforming equip equipment should be maintained. There are requirements for grounds and roadways. A suitable external environment should be established, monitored, and periodically reviewed. Premises should be free of waste or accumulated debris and vegetation, so not as to attract pests and vermin. Paths and roadways and loading and unloading areas should be maintained. They should be adequately redrained. Drains shall be separate from site drainage system. And paths from Amenities leading to site entrances should be effectively sealed. So on to section 2, site 11.2, uh, site operation. Repairs and maintenance. The maintenance methods and responsibilities must be documented. Maintenance must be carried out in a manner that minimizes the risk of contamination. Records of maintenance work should be retained. Site supervisors shall be notified when maintenance or repairs are to be undertaken in any processing, handling or storage area. The maintenance supervisor and the site supervisor shall be informed if any repairs or maintenance activities pose a potential threat to product safety. Where possible, maintenance should be conducted outside operating times and temporary repairs need to be managed. Where there is a risk, maintenance chemicals such as lubricants should be food grade. Maintenance staff and contractors must comply with hygiene requirements. Maintenance staff and contracts should remove all tools and debris from any maintenance activity once it has been completed and inform the area supervisor, maintenance supervisor, so appropriate hygiene and sanitation can be conducted and a pre-operational inspected completed prior to restarting site operations. Calibration. The methods and responsibility for calibration of measuring, test and inspection equipment used for key monitoring activities must be documented and implemented. Calibrated equipment must be protected from damage and unauthorized adjustment. Equipment must be calibrated to national or international reference standards. Pest prevention. A comprehensive documented pest prevention program needs it to be effectively implemented. There are specific requirements in the SQF code that I suggest you refer to. They include control of chemicals. The chemicals are required to be approved by the relevant authority and their safety data shape sheets available. Adequate measures should be in place to prevent pests. 
from entering the building or roosting. Pest control contractors or in, and or internal pest contractors controllers should be licensed and trained. There are other requirements to consider. On to cleaning and sanitation. sanitation. The methods and responsibility for effective cleaning of the food handling and processing equipment and environment and storage areas shall be documented and implemented. Consideration should be given to who is responsible for the cleaning, validation of cleaning procedures for food contact surfaces, including CIP, the responsibility and methods used to verify the effectiveness of the cleaning and sanitation program. There should be control of cleaning equipment. Standards should be understood and communicated. Detergents and sanitizers should be suitable for use in a food manufacturing environment labelled according to regulatory requirements and purchased in accordance with applicable legislation. There are specific, specific requirements for the management of control of detergents and sanitizers, also cleaning in play systems, cleaning equipment, tools, racks, having suitably equipped areas for cleaning product containers, control of knives, cutting boards, racks and containers for stored clean utensils. The limits of acceptable and unacceptable cleaning performance should be defined for food contact surfaces and process equipment. Pre-operation inspections should be conducted by qualified personnel. The responsibility and methods used to verify the effectiveness of cleaning procedures should be documented and a verification schedule prepared. A record of pre-operational hygiene inspections, cleaning and sanitation activities and verification activities should be maintained. On to personal hygiene and welfare. Personnel suffering from infection diseases should be, should be excluded. Measures should be in place to prevent contact of materials, ingredients, food packaging, food, for any bodily fluids from open wounds, coughing, sneezing, spitting, or other means. Personnel with expo exposed cut sores or lesions must be excluded. Hand washing stations must be provided adjacent to personnel access. Clothing and personal effects. A risk analysis is required to ensure that clothing and hair policy protects material, food and food contact services from unintentional microbiological or physical contamination. Clothing worn by staff engaged in food handling must be maintained, stored and laundered so as not as to present a contamination risk. Jewelry and other loose objects should not be worn or taken into a food handling or processing operation. Visitors must be controlled. They must wear suitable clothing and footwear and comply with hygiene rules. Visitors exhibiting visible signs of illness need to be excluded. There are requirements for staff amenities, including specifics for change rooms, high risk areas, toilet break rooms and outside eating areas. High-risk change areas need to be provided for staff engaged in the processing of high-risk foods or processing operations in which clothing can be soiled. All staff engaged in food operations must ensure that products and materials are handled in a store in a way that does to prevent product damage or contamination. There should be a hygiene policy. Personnel should comply with prescribed hygiene practices. The flow of personnel in processing and handling the area should be managed such that the potential for contamination is minimized. Water, ice and air supply. Adequate supplies of potable water from a known clean source must be provided. Supplies of hot and cold water must be provided to enable effective cleaning. Non-potable water should be identified and controlled. Water treatment should be effective and monitored. 
There is a requirement that water complies with local, national or internationally recognised potable water and microbiological and quality standards. Microbiological anal analysis is required for water and ice supplies. Ice provided for use during processing or as a processing aid or as an ingredient shall comply with local, national or internationally recognised potable water standards. There are also standards for ice rooms and recep receptacles. Air and other gases. Compare compressed air and other gases that contact food or food contact surface needs to be clean and present no risk of contamination. They should be monitored and maintained. Onto receipt, storage and transport. The requirements for re receipt, storage and handling of goods. There should be safe, hygienic receipt and storage of raw materials, ingredients, packaging and equipment and chemicals. There are requirements for cold storage, freezing and chilling of foods, storage of dry ingredients, packaging and shelf stable packaged goods. Requirements for the storage of hazardous chemicals and toxic substances. The practices applied during unloading, loading and transport of food should maintain appropriate storage conditions and product integrity. Foods must be loaded, transported and unloaded under conditions suitable to prevent cross-contamination. During transport of food, measures should be taken to protect food from potential sources of contamination, damage and provide a suitable environment. Vehicles should be fit for purpose and are adequately designed and constructed. Vehicles shall be secured from tampering using seals or other agreed upon and acceptable devices or systems. Loading and unloading docks should be designed to protect the product during unloading and loaded. Refrigeration units shall maintain the product at required temperature. Unlanded processes shall be designed to minimise unnecessary exposure of the product to conditions detrimental to maintaining product and package integrity. On to separation of functions. The processing of high-risk food must be conducted under controlled conditions. There must be protection of segregation from other processes, raw materials or staff who handle raw materials to ensure cross-contamination is minimised. There are requirements for changing into clean, distinctive, protective clothing. Thawing of food. There are requirements for control of thawing of foods, including having appropriate rooms or equipment. Control of foreign matter contamination. The responsibility and methods used to prevent foreign matter contamination, the product must be documented, implemented and communicated to all staff. Plant and equipment should be inspected to ensure they are in good condition and free from potential contaminants. There needs to be measures to prevent contamination with glass, brittle materials, wood, metal and other foreign bodies. Glass, glass items should be prohibited unless absolutely necessary. When used, they should be checked regularly and any breakage reported. There should be procedures to minimise foreign body contamination in originating from the packaging container. This may include the use of co co covered conveyors, container inversion and foreign body removal through rinsing with air or water jets. There should be control of sharp metal implements and stationery. And other physical, potential physical contaminants, such as pens uh, or dip, uh, outer packaging. Wooden pallets need to be controlled where used. And the detection of foreign objects, the methods and responsibilities for monitoring, maintaining, calibrating and using screens, filters and other technologies to remove or detect foreign matter must be documented and implemented. 
In all cases of foreign matter contamination, the affected batch or item must be controlled. And to waste disposal. The responsibility and methods used to collect, handle and store waste prior to removal from the premises must be documented and implemented. Waste must be removed on a regular basis and not allowed to accumulate it. Designated waste areas should be maintained in a clean and tidy equipment. It's in condition, sorry. Waste handling equipment, vehicles, storage containers and storage areas should be maintained in good condition and cleaned and sanitized regularly. The effectiveness of site of waste management should be included in site inspections. Uh, just to round off, a common theme in food safety standards is the need to address uh, risks and carry out risk assessment. So I've, uh, you'll get a copy of the presentation. I've summarized the reference to risks for your information. Okay, which you can refer back to. Uh, the SQFI offers a, a, a a broad range of resources. Um, there are new edition nine um, how-to guides, including, uh, for example, uh, how to do risk assessments, and those are available now. The codes themselves are free to download, and they also offer um, events and training. Um, so I'll answer questions now, uh, but the last slide, I'd just like to mention that um, the yeah, IFSQN offer SQF food safety management system implementation packages. Um, you can get them on via that link. And I think Simon will put the link in the sidebar. So any questions? Okay, the um, thanks, Tony. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I picked up the wrong link. So the link to uh, the SQF packages there uh, is if you click on that link, you'll see the various um, systems for food, manufacturer storage, packaging, etc. But we'll include that link in the follow up, follow -up email. So are we ready to take some questions, Tony? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the presentation. And okay, um, so let's see. Uh, Evelyn, any idea when the numbering changes will come into? Uh, there there are a there, there, there are a number available on the on the SQF website. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if those are um, uh, available for packaging yet. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, just I, I, I mean, uh, it, from the, uh, the the changes, uh, the, there are changes document, key changes documents that are available, um, so, uh, so which will give you an idea of the numbering changes. Okay, Vicky said overwhelming, but really important to know and implement. And Chishak, God bless you for this wonderful presentation. You know, uh, in an hour, you've it took a, a lot of time and effort to condense that. I mean, I know you've got to do it to update the manuals, but um, to to go through that is very painstaking. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a squeeze. Yeah, there is a lot there, but what what uh, I don't I, I don't really like to. Um, I want to cover everything, and uh, in, in, in as much as it allows it in an hour, and so you know. That's, sure. that's what it is, yeah. But you've got a copy. There is a lot there. There's a, you can refer back to it. You're getting a copy of the presentation, and there's a lot of useful things in there, uh, including pictures and examples of standards that apply rather than just saying the words. I'm showing you pictures of stuff that I would expect in terms of standards. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, Mary, um, how can we validate uh, a screen used in power powder dispensing as part of CCP validation. Uh, 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 well, if you look at uh, uh, um, the size of the screen uh, uh, and the uh, and and the, um, 
the size of the mesh. Uh, now, it, it, I'm not sure which industry you're talking about, but there's various guidelines. There's some from USDA on um, uh, on their guidelines for prosecution for the size of foreign bodies, and typically the size is seven millimeters, and I use that as a validation reference. But if it's for people that are susceptible to illness or children, uh, it's less than that. And so I would also refer to industry standards, typical agreed industry standards uh, and accepted industry practices. Okay, Vivette, how do you revalidate critical limits? And same way you would do it originally, you look for documented uh, scientific information, regulations um, that, um, that um, show, demonstrate your um, control measure can is capable of controlling your hazard now you don't need to you can review it yearly and if the same information is still um, available and relevant then you don't need to revalidate what the, what the code says you need to review and revalidate when changes occur so if something changes that's when you need to revalidate for sure okay yeah. um, to uh people asking the same thing, Alberto and Mahmoud. Uh, the, what are the main differences between BRC and SQF, sort of at a top level, as you would see? Uh, main differences, I think, um, um, the BRC is a bit more prescriptive and structured, and um, in terms of uh, food labeling, uh, certainly more prescriptive in that. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, uh, yeah. Okay, Joy. Does a food food defence plan require a vulnerability assessment? Uh, vulnerability uh, assessment. Yeah, well, you would. Uh, yes, you you do your assessment, uh, and then um, based on your assessment, you make a, a plan. A few. So the, you start with the assessment and then you formulate a plan based on that. So, you know. Uh, J James is asking if we can review food safety culture a little deeper. I mean, that's a whole, at least a, an hour presentation, if not a training course to go into food safety culture, I guess. I think I've given you quite a bit in, in what I've given you in the slides there. So I would refer... Um, back to those but I think from a personal view it's about um, having a philosophy of food safety and communicating it as a manager to the rest of the team and getting those on board and then also down and back up so down to the staff uh, empowering them to report issues uh, giving them inf relevant information and allowing them to pass that information back up so it's back up down back sideways whatever the key to it really is leadership from the top and communication and and management to have the right philosophy yeah okay uh, stephanie edition 8.1 had really thorough guidance docs okay uh, i've UX. briefly uh, touched on this uh, and edition i would still refer back to edition 8.1 because those are still there but what um sqf doing now uh, they're producing uh, um, how-to guides. Um, so um, I think I've got a link to a post I've made on. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, I've posted on the forums. Hold on, copy. I've posted on the forums and... there there's there's what the how-to guide these are the new things they're doing appear to do instead uh, sqf are doing instead of um guidance documents there are how-to guides okay okay um okay um would you consider a citified processing a high-risk process per sqf guidelines um A sit of, what is it? A sort of, Would you consider uh, a city, a citified processing a high risk process? 
Um, it's it's less than non-acidified, but it it possibly could be yes. All right. I, I mean, I would refer to to um, the SQF code and, and look at which specific product you're looking at, uh, and it, it should um, do do that there. But if it it depends if it's all enclosed and how much exposure um, there is. Um, so it, if it's all enclosed, then it's less likely to be um, high risk. Okay, um, we've got there. Uh, what will the auditor be looking for specifically evidence uh, for food safety culture what they'll be looking for they'll be looking for communication team briefings um you know um staff are involved in objectives they're briefed with objectives there's a reporting system they can report um food objectives uh, sorry, uh, food safety issues. They're, they're involved in setting uh, objectives, um, staff briefings, um, you know, uh, management review of full safety culture, um, interviews with staff, um, staff reward schemes. Um, you know, you know, the, there's many things you can do, and I think I've mentioned quite a lot of those. Okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, food, on these how-to guidance from SQF, the, there is a food safety culture one. So have a look at that. Um, on the forums, there's a link to SQF website and have a look at the how-to uh, food safety culture and it will tell you what records um, um, could be uh, applicable that you could, uh, you could to demonstrate a food safety culture. Right, thanks, Tony. Um... Uh, Peggy, um, just trying to find that one. Um, Peggy, if we manufacture, store, and distribute our own products, do we need to use the storage distribution code along with 2 and 11? Um, I, 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 I would talk to your certification body, but I mean, um, my, my, my view is that you would, um, you would get certified to the um, manufacturing code and your scope would include storage and distribution. Okay. Uh, and you know, we talked about the difference between BRC and SQF. What about sure. the difference uh, with FSSC? Yeah, uh, the FSSC is different in that it's based on, uh, it's more uh, based on traditional ISO standards. So ISO 22000. And uh, so, so there's a structured uh, risk and opportunities gen generic sort of thing uh, that you need to have assessment for. But the main thing is when you implement your uh, food safety plans, you need to have three categories, uh, which are um, critical control points, operational prerequisite programs and prerequisite programs. And there's a whole raft of prescribed um, um, ways um, in de how you determine whether something's a critical control point or an operational prerequisite program. And then uh, there's a difference between the critical control point and um, those have critical limits, whereas an operational uh, prerequisite program has an action criterion. So it's, it's less, somewhat less specific. So it's a bit more complicated, basically. Okay, um, yep. I just want to say that I've loaded in the sidebar the direct link to the Food uh, Manufacturers Edition 9 uh, SQF that we do have, that Tony has written and updated extensively. Um, so at least just put a, a, a link to the changes between 8.1 and Edition 9. Uh, David's asking, um, is it normal reasonable for an auditor to look at the last one year of customer complaints guess it is isn't it um that's they would do it in, it might be a year um it depends it, you an auditor would normally want to look at complaints going back to your last audit yeah. um yeah uh, he'd also want to look at trends so you might uh, if i'm auditing you i would say well uh, yeah, I'll look at these, but I want to look at your audit, uh, complaint performance last year. 
So yeah. I want to see if you've uh, you might say you've improved, but I want to see if you have or see evidence that you you have. Yes. Uh, and and Keita, uh, how can I validate my HACCP plan? Well, you um, validate your um, control measures, your critical control points. Uh, that's with um, documented evidence that proves the control measure is capable of achieving the desired result, which is product safety. So this might be regulations such as minimum pasteurization, temperature for milk. Uh, it might be scientific literature. It might be um, trials on site. Um, yeah, it, it might be um, industry codes of practice. Excuse me. Um, yeah. Eileen's uh, going back to customer complaints. What happens if you've had zero customer complaints? I would review your complaint ca capture um, systems. <laughs> yeah. So, so as an yeah, audit, yeah, I would say, well, mm, uh, I don't know. It depends how many products you've got, etc. But if you if you're not on any customer complaints, then um, I, I I would say, okay, well, we just need to review our systems and make sure. We people do know and are aware how to um, complain to us. Yeah, you know that maybe that's something for the management review. No complaints. It's the right information uh, on our package packaging on our labels to notify people about how to complain to us. So the senior director bangs the table and de demands to know why we haven't got any customer complaints. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Uh, so Eileen, uh, we supply produce under supermarket label and hope supermarket passes them on. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, some supermarkets are absolutely brilliant at reporting complaints and some are useless. Yeah. Yeah. You can, if you're in that's their hands, that's, you can only go off what they send you, I guess. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's it then. Thanks very much, Tony, for that. Um, fantastic. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, have a good weekend. Brilliant. Uh, all right. Thanks very much to Tony. Uh, we'll follow up afterwards with the um, recording, the slides, uh, links to the uh, SQF manuals and the presentation uh, and the certificate which is in the sidebar now anyway. Uh, remember, when you download that, uh, you either print and sign it yourself or you edit it in an image editing package. I say it every week, but I still get dozens of emails asking me uh, where the name is. We don't personalize them for free webinars. You have to do that yourself. So thanks very much for attending today. Happy Friday, everybody. Uh, take care of yourselves and. Uh, Enjoy the weekend. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.